Here I want to calculate two kind of hard derivatives using the limit definition of the derivative. Now these derivatives would each be fairly easy if we were to use derivative rules including the chain rule and some well-known derivatives of functions. But I think sometimes doing things the hard way, like finding the derivative using the limit definition, will gain us some insight into common mathematical tricks. Okay, so let's just recall what the limit definition of the derivative is. So the derivative with respect to x of a function f of x is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And the first function that we'll look at is sine of the square root of x. And along the way, we'll use the following trigonometric identity, which I will not derive. So we've got sine alpha minus sine beta is equal to two sine alpha minus beta over two times cosine alpha minus beta over two. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So we can write this as the limit as h approaches zero of sine of the square root of x plus h minus sine of the square root of h all over h. Okay, great. So that's just the limit definition of the derivative. Okay, next we will use this formula where alpha is square root of x plus h and beta is equal to just the square root of x. Let's see what happens to our limit, really the numerator inside of our limit using this identity. So that's gonna give us two times the limit as h goes to zero of sine of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over two times cosine of the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x over two. And then this is all still over h. So I was able to factor the two out because the limit is like a linear operation. Okay, where do we wanna go from here? Well, I wanna use the following fact. So let's use the fact that the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta is equal to one. So I'll just put that as a fact down here. And somehow we wanna force something that looks like sine theta over theta into this integral. Well, the kind of obvious way to do that with our current setup is for this guy right here to play the role of theta. But we don't have anything like that in the denominator. So if we add something like that into the denominator, then we'll have to include something like that in the numerator. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by this value of theta. So that's gonna give us two, and then we have this limit as h goes to zero of sine of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over two over the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over two. So that's from including this guy in the denominator. And then we also need to put it in the numerator. So we have the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over h. And then finally, we have a cosine of the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x over two. Okay, so just to reiterate what happened, we included this guy in the denominator but doing that, we also had to include this guy right here in the numerator, and I just realized I left off a 2h, which is necessary to counteract this two right here. Okay, so now we can split this up into a couple of limits, and we can only do that because all of these limits exist. So this is gonna be equal to two, and then the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta, and that's where we've made the substitution theta equals square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over two, just inside of this portion of the limit. Okay, and then next we'll have one half times the limit as h goes to zero of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over h. So that's from this thing right here, I brought the two out. And then finally, we have the limit as h goes to zero of cosine of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over two. 
Okay, so now that we've gotten everything into that form, let's maybe bring that up to the top and then we'll finish this first example off. So on the last board, we got our goal derivative of the function sine of the square root of x using the limit definition down to the product of these three limits. So we've got the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta. Then we've got the limit as h goes to zero of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x over h. And then finally, we have the limit as h goes to zero of cosine square root of x plus h plus the square root of x over two. And I wanna be careful to point out that on the last board, there was a bit of a typo and we had a minus sign here, but that should indeed be a plus sign. Now let's see what cancellation can occur. So notice this two can cancel with that half. So we can just scrub those out. And then next we can use the well-known fact, which we mentioned on the last board, that the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta is in fact equal to one. And then over here, we know cosine is a continuous function. And this limit clearly exists without anything funny happening. And so that we can just set h equal to zero here and see that we get two times the square root of x over two. In other words, we just get the square root of x for that. So putting that all together, we see that we have cosine of the square root of x from that term times the limit as h goes to zero of this. But before I bring that down, I wanna do some simplification on this limit. So the standard trick here is to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. So let's do just that. So let's see what that gives us. So that gives us a difference of squares in the numerator of x plus h minus x, in other words, h. Then in the denominator, we have h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x, like that. Now let's notice that this h will cancel with this h, and then these two will add up in the limit to two times the square root of x, but that's occurring in the denominator. So putting this all together, we see that we have one over two times the square root of x times cosine the square root of x which is what we would expect using the chain rule. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we're gonna do one more quick example. For our last example, we're gonna look at the derivative of e to the x squared, again, using the limit definition. So that means we need to calculate the limit as h approaches zero of e to the x plus h quantity squared minus e to the x squared all over h. Now, being motivated by what we know the answer should be, we should probably have an e to the x squared as a multiplier. So that gives us some motivation to factor an e to the x squared out of this numerator. So let's see what that gives us. So we'll have e to the x squared, and then the limit as h approaches zero of e to the x plus h quantity squared minus x squared minus one all over h. So that's all occurring in the exponent. But let's notice that that's a difference of squares. Obviously you could simplify that a number of different ways, but I wanna think of it as a difference of squares just because I think it's like kind of a cute way of attacking what's happening in that exponent. So let's look at x plus h squared minus x squared. That's going to simplify to x plus h minus x and then x plus h plus x. But let's notice that that gives us h times 2x plus h. And now we'll rewrite our limit using that observation. So we have this is e to the x squared times the limit as h approaches zero of e to the 2xh plus h squared minus one over h. So let's again be motivated by where we think we should end up. And that is that this guy right here should be equal to 2x. Because by the chain rule, we know this should be equal to 2x times e to the x squared. So here I'm going to do something which is not really in the spirit of the problem. And that is doing things by definition. And I'm going to do a Taylor expansion. 
in order to simplify this numerator. If anyone knows how to do this without a Taylor expansion, maybe post it in the comments, like an outline of your solution from here to the end. So I'm gonna recall that e to the u is equal to one plus u plus u squared over two factorial plus u cubed over three factorial and so on and so forth. Now I can set u equal to this guy in the exponent, in other words, this 2xh plus h squared, and that's gonna give me the following. So I've got this limit as h goes to zero. Notice my one is gonna cancel with this one, and I'll be left with 2xh plus h squared plus one over two factorial times 2xh plus h squared quantity squared plus dot, 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 forever and ever and ever, and this is all over h. But next, I want to notice that these terms, which I'm putting in orange parentheses, all have a factor of h squared. So this one comes obviously naturally from this h squared. Here we get a factor of h squared by the fact that this binomial is squared. And the next term will have that binomial cubed, so we'll have a factor of h squared we can get from that. So in other words, we can take all of this and write it as h squared times some other stuff. And that's all over h from this denominator right here. So that means that this h will cancel this h squared down to an h to the first power. And then as h goes to zero, all of that will go to zero. So in other words, all of this trends off to zero as h tends to zero. But what's left? We're left with 2xh over h, that's gonna cancel with that, and we're left with just 2x. So that gives us a final answer of 2x e to the x squared, which again is what is expected. And that's a good place to stop.